Gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, is recognized for, for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, feels like it's been a while since we had these. Um, I think it's been six weeks um, since I've been behind this microphone, six weeks since we basically shot ourselves in the temple and all the other craziness that went on. And the amazing thing is in that six weeks, you'd be stunned how much the numbers, the debt numbers, have moved against us. And, and this is just a fascinating time. Think of this, within a month or so, we've actually been having to recalculate our projections of debt deficits and what was going on. If that doesn't give you a sense of this thing called interest rate fragility, basically meaning as interest rates go up, it's consuming more and more and more of the available resources that you would have either put into your communities or maybe into military or other things. But right now, you're gonna, I'm going to show you a couple charts in a moment. Interest and, and the um, uh, Office of Management Budget, Treasury, just a couple hours ago did an update that shows that gross interest this fiscal year will not be the fourth biggest expense, it will be the second biggest expense. Social Security, interest, Medicare, defense. Now that's a gross number, but we're going to talk about what gross and, and net means in the U.S. government interest rate world. So let's actually walk through some of the primers here. And once again, our basic rule is if you don't like math and don't want to deal with reality, please stop watching. This is our update from 2023. 73% of the spending members of Congress get functionally have no voice on. We don't vote on it. That's mandatory. That's Social Security, that's Medicare, that's certain veterans benefits, certain tribal benefits, those things that are formula. We call mandatory. They can, they're mostly earned benefits. Some are benefits that are, you get because you fell below a certain income, but they're a formula. You see this green and this blue? The blue is defense. The green, 15%. That's all other, let's call it non-defense discretionary. The blue, obviously, is all of defense. That's 13%. All of this colored area right here, the green and the blue, is on borrowed money. Every dime members of Congress vote on is on borrowed money. And then last year, about $400 billion of this red was on borrowed money. So as we kick each other's heads in here, which a lot of it's well worth doing, fighting for a little here, a little there, we're borrowing about $6.5 billion a day. Um, I think on average about $77,000, $78,000 a second. And, and one of the reasons I come back to this is being home this weekend, having some conversations with people. These are smart. I represent one of the best educated districts in America. And you have these conversations, David. David, if it just weren't for waste and fraud, David, if it weren't for foreign aid, or my friends on the left, and I'm going to show a bunch of slides here because I need to nail this down. If we just would tax rich people more, we'd be fine. None of that is true. You take the math and take every Democrat proposal, let's start with this one, and do tax maximization on those over 400000 so on estate tax, income tax, capital gains tax. You do the tax maximization and then do the economic model, you get about 1.5% of GDP. Last year, we borrowed 8.4% of GDP. Turns out, 1.5% is a hell of a lot less than 84 But this being a math-free zone, I thought we might do this several times to see if some of it sinks in. So once again, 73% of our spending is on autopilot. If we don't really move defense, all we're fighting over right now is within this green wedge, 15% of our spending. That's what's going on. So let's actually talk through 
what's happening around us. If I had come to this floor a year or two ago and said gross interest in the 2024 fiscal year was going to cross over a trillion dollars, you would have laughed your hearts out. Guess what? Um, OMB a couple hours ago confirmed it's going, gross interest is going to be over $1 trillion this year, making it the second biggest expense of this government. Does anyone understand a couple years ago, it was three, four years ago, we were looking at numbers of $300, $400 billion. We've more than doubled it. Does anyone care? Is it, is it just one of those, um, you know, we, we can just continue to ignore it? Um, a couple months ago, I came here and showed some charts that in this fiscal year, we're going to bring 9.6, that was our best model, 9.6 trillion to market. About 2 trillion we estimated to be virgin, new issuance. That's from the borrowing from this year. The rest is what we call refinancing. It's the short bonds, even some longer bonds, that many of these bonds were really low, I mean, just slightly above zero, and they're coming back for refinancing. And all of a sudden you have, you know, how many, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars that are down here with almost no interest expense to this government, to our taxpayers, and now they're coming in and we're starting to see mean interest well over, or moving over 3%, and it keeps going up. This should be what we talk about on the floor. If this continues, it consumes everything in its path. Is interest Republican or Democrat? It's just something we have to pay. But trust me, we'll find a way to turn it partisan. And this is one of the punchlines I need us to try to get our heads around. We're modeling for the 2024 year. So the fiscal year we're in now, we just finished our first month of it. Social Security, we expect to be, come in about $1,450,000,000. Um, Gross interest, as of a couple hours ago, we adjusted it. We actually had it, our model was $2 billion over this. But um, CBO came in and said, hey, gross interest is now over a trillion dollars. And if you want to do net, and now might be a time to explain the difference. What's the difference between net interest and gross interest? When Treasury reaches over to the Social Security Trust Fund, which is also gone in about eight, nine years, reaches over and grabs that money and spends it. We put special T bills, trust treasury bills over there, but we have to pay them interest. We pay them interest twice a year. It's still an expense. It's still money that got paid as for the rent of that money. And you take all the trust funds, and that's the difference between whether we're going to pay as the Treasury is coming back and saying 839, I need to disclose my model, our joint economic model is closer to 879, and we've been more accurate the last two years than Treasury has. But gross interest, money we will spend on interest as this government is now over a trillion dollars. The second or third biggest spend now is Medicare. Medicare moved up 12.3% last year. So for its scale, interest moved up 38%, Medicare moved up over 12%. Those are the primary growers in borrowing and spending. And then number four, the fourth biggest expense now is defense. You run into someone at the grocery store back home and ask them, particularly if they lean on the left side, and they almost immediately, viscerally go straight to defense. How many of them will believe saying, hey, but defense is now the fourth biggest expenditure. It's no longer the first, it's not the second, it's not the third, it's the fourth. And interest now has become the second. If I had held up this chart a year ago, you would have stared at me like I was out of my mind. It's happened. It's happened and we've talked about this was coming. And, and, and in some ways it saddens me the predictions come true. And you gotta understand, when you start seeing these, and, and we, did this, we did it in chart fashion to try to make it more visual, 
Here's Social Security. Here's interest. Here's Medicare. Here's defense now. Health care costs and interest. Your government is an insurance company with an army. And the interest payments just keep coming. Um, we actually believe this number is wrong, but it, we think it's out of date. But the point of this chart is to show you the fast moving, what interest fragility is doing to us. Um, 2022, we spent $475 billion in interest. 2023, we spent $659, and we thought that was outrageous. Our number is actually $880 for, um, for primary interest, not gross. But even if we use the most conservative number we've been given, and this number is already now a month or so out of date, you know, you're looking at another 30% growth in just that spending line. And that's not counting for the interest we pay ourselves from the borrowing when we borrow out of the trust funds. And look, I know this didn't move the markets. And it won't move the markets until we start to have a really stressed bond auction. But you already know that two of the big credit rating agencies have done an actual downgrade. Moody's, last Friday, basically put us on downgrade watch. They still let us have our AAA, but they said, we believe the bias is now negative. You do realize there's five, six countries now out there that have better credit ratings than the United States. Good jobs, guys. We, did, we should all be very, very proud of ourselves. And not that anyone here pays attention to the bond market. Why I keep coming back to the bond market is because we are incapable of doing our job here, telling the truth about the math. Remember, 100% of the borrowing from today through the few, next 30 years is demographics. It takes away some of the political fun out of it, doesn't it? When you can't sort of say, well, it's this or that. We got old. Take a look at the baseline data. It's healthcare costs, it's interest, it's Medicare, it's Social Security in functioning nine years when that trust fund is gone. This is a chart of what happened, I think it was Thursday or Friday. We had a 30-year bond auction. Did anyone pay attention to the fact that it was substantially what they call undersubscribed? It wasn't a disaster. But it was definitely signs of stress. It shot up. That's what this line is here. They had to spike up the interest rates on those 30-year bonds to get the buyers, get them sold. And I believe, and I may have my number wrong, I believe the primary dealers, this is actually a special deal they have with Treasury, the primary dealers had to take down, had to buy almost a quarter of these bonds. Past years, it would only been around 12%. That is a big deal. The fact of the matter is when you had to turn the switch and the dealers had to take down the bonds because there weren't enough buyers. Does anyone in this body pay any attention to the fact that if we're borrowing $6.5 billion a day and then we're about to refinance several trillion dollars this year, how much of this we have to bring to market every couple of weeks? If this had gotten a little bit worse, this would have been the headlines over the weekend. And let's actually start to walk through, once again, our realities. Social Security, and the, and the reason I'm walking through this chart is I'm going to spend some time on where the spending is, I'm going to spend some time on where the tax receipts are and who pays them. We're going to spend some time on some of the proposals out there to show how hollow they are. Because I'm so tired of having conversations with people who I know are smart and they're so wrapped in folklore 
about the U.S. debt and deficits. And even this body, we will knife each other, which, trust me, I've been involved in those knife fights. I've offered some of the most brutal amendments on this floor for cutting spending. But we'll go to war with each other, and the debate time on the floor, if we're borrowing $77,000 a second, there was more borrowing during the time of the debate than the amendment would have saved. Social Security is about 21% of our spend. Now, you always need to think of Social Security as unique. It functionally has its own tax line, you know, FICA taxes. But why do we keep coming back and paying attention to it? And this is one of the brutal dishonesties I get particularly from our brothers and sisters on the left. I, I actually watched um, one Democrat member over here who I think she's running for Senate in California on a, one of the left-wing um, cable television shows holding a little whiteboard going, you see, it adds nothing to the deficit. She's absolutely right. Social Security adds nothing to the deficit. Today, in nine years, we double senior poverty. Because in nine years, there's a 25% cut to Social Security. And I'm going to walk through some of those slides to understand the scale. That's one of the reasons, if you have someone talking about debt and deficits and they're talking about the future, if they're not talking about how to save Social Security, they're completely dishonest. They're absolutely hollow. They're immoral. And I'm going to show also the proposals being given to us by the left on what we could tax only get you about 20%. I'm going to show the charts and say, just get rid of the cap. Tax everyone the 12.4%. You only cover about 20% of the shortfall. We have no concept, the scale. Remember, the shortfall is functionally three quarters of what we spend on defense. I, there's this lack of understanding how brutal the math is. And no, you can't actually tax your way out of this. And no, my brothers and sisters, we can't actually cut our way out of this because the growth is actually because we got old. We made promises, and we haven't figured out how to finance them. And it's a moral imperative that this group gets off its high knees and starts buying some, putting some batteries in their calculator and starts understanding the scale of what we're talking about. Social Security is 21%. Medicare is 13. Um, uh, national defense, 13. Interest was 10. That was last year. Guess what? That interest now is closer to 13, 14, 15 percent of our total budget. Just in that function, one year, now that we're starting to refinance our bonds and the trillions we're having to sell that are new borrowing, those new interest rates, this whole hierarchy is changing. And we get what for paying the interest? And no, if you're one of the people that goes, well, we're paying China. China now only owns, we think, maybe eight, nine hundred billion dollars of our bonds. Still a lot of money. And yes, they may hold certain of our bonds on offshore. Our best guesstimate is Japan owns more, is our number one um, person, one we're indebted. But that's only like a trillion, trillion four. Everything, most of the rest is actually we finance ourselves. So we own our Oh, our own pension systems, your retirement. I bet you if you have a 401k, you'd find out that part of this U.S. sovereign debt is in it. And this is important to understand when we start talking about the growth of our obligations. This year, 12,000 of our brothers and sisters turned 65 a day. This was one of, 65 years ago, this was one of the peak years of the baby boom. We get 12,000 baby boomers turned 65 a day right now. So our estimate is Social Security this year will pop up to $1,450,000,000,000. But you see, and that's about a 7.9% growth, even though the COLA is only a fraction of that. You know, last year the COLA was 8 point something, 8.3. And the spending went up 11, 11.1. How to do that? Because of the increase in populations. A decade ago, one out of eight Americans was 65. 
Two years ago, one out of six was 65. It's demographics. How often do we ever talk about the reality of our demographics? How many of you saw the article, you know, Census Bureau put out their report a couple days ago? Did you see what's happening on our fertility rates? Looks like in 15, 18 years, this country has more deaths than births. We have about 40, maybe 50 years, and actually then we roll over and the United States actually might start to have a declining population. It's demographics. And that's part of our job here. But it would require math. So let's actually walk through something that just frustrates me so much because I believe it's moral to fix it and immoral to avoid the conversation. And the fact I talk about saving Social Security, I get ads. I get attack ads at home because at first, oh, he talked about it. We let's attack him. Our model, and it's not 2034, it's 2033. We have a mistake on our boards. I apologize for that. We estimate in functioning, this is nine years, nine budget years. The very first year the trust fund is gone, the shortfall is $616 billion. Okay, first year, trust fund is gone. So let's go to the solutions we get from our left. Let's just tax everyone over $400,000, we're going to tax them the 12.4% tax, okay? Unlimited income, and they get no benefit for it. All right. Except the problem is the best math says that gets you about $86 billion. Remember, 616 is the shortfall, and I did this on a single year to make it more understandable. 616, 616 billion is my shortfall. It's our shortfall. In 2033, Taxing everyone over 400,000, the 12.4% tax and giving them no benefit only produces about 86 billion. All right, so let's get rid of that. No cap at all. You get your benefits up to what is it right now, 160, 200. Next year, I think it's 168. But we're going to tax everyone above that, that's the 12.3% or 12.4%, but you get no benefits. How much of that first year shortfall would it cover? Remember, the shortfall is 616 billion. You cover 164 of it. 20%? This is the solution we're being given. Does anyone understand the scale? And the fact that to recapitalize something that's burning through in a, in a few years, that's three quarters of a trillion dollars a year shortfall. What does it take to recapitalize parts of that Social Security trust fund or to actually have enough taxes? I'm going to show you a slide now where you can, in a little while, where you can go to a 20% VAT tax in the United States with all the other taxes, and you still can't get close to covering the Social Security shortfall. Why isn't this place terrified about this? Because it's such a great political issue to attack people to try to save it. And is it moral the fact that in nine years you double senior poverty in America? Because that's what's being laid upon us. Yet you see these parasite groups that fill up our email boxes. You can't talk about that. Just tax rich people more. I'm going to keep showing you. you can't, it doesn't get you anywhere near what's required. We're going to have to do really difficult but really complex Complex problems all have simple solutions that are absolutely wrong. Turns out complex problems require complex solutions. And in this case, require a hell of a lot of math. Reason this chart, all the big trust funds are gone over the next eight and a half, nine years. Transportation's gone. Medicare Part A is gone. And the big behemoth, Social Security Trust Fund, is gone. But I'm glad we're spending lots of time working on the fact that how we're going to not dramatically increase senior poverty in this country, how we're not about to do what's necessary to protect our brothers and sisters, how what's necessary to grow the economy. 
that my, I have a 16 month old son, I have an eight year old daughter. No making fun of being about an old dad. My wife's exactly my age. Do they have the right to live as well as we did? Because if you look at the math, the basic math from CBO says something like in 20 years, every single US tax needs to double just to maintain baseline services. Does anyone here actually care? Is it too hard? Is this too difficult? I thought this was what we were here for. To, to, to basically have common prosperity and instead we lie. Or we lie through avoidance. And even 100% tax ratio or tax rates on small businesses, upper income families, when we did the math, you know, we're heading towards times. Remember, we borrowed 8.4% of GDP, so this slide is already out of date. You do 100% tax, which obviously is anyone who the most basic elementary school economics class, you know, when you take everything, no one works at all. But if you took every dime of upper income families and small businesses, you might cover 5% of GDP. Think about that. If we borrowed 8.4% of GDP last year during a time when we're being told how wonderful Bidenomics was, how wonderful the economy was, does anyone see something's horribly wrong around us? And you start walking through the actual pay-fors. And, and the reason this slide is really important, this is just the Social Security and Medicare. Just Social Security and Medicare. The shortfall is about 5.5% of the economy. And we're using 2040 as the base here. So if you have 5.5%, that's the, the, the amount of the economy that it's short. And you start walking through. So one of the reasons I grabbed this board is there was something here. Impose a 20% VAT tax, a national sales tax. It doesn't even come close to covering half of the Social Security shortfall. And that's a 20% VAT tax. And understand, VAT taxes basically crush the middle class. So we have this fight around here, you know, the middle class, the porking poor. These numbers are, are terrifying. But we'll do everything we can to avoid telling the truth. In just 20 months, President Biden's added $4.8 to the 10-year deficits. So all the people that spend their time attacking the 2017 tax reform that did an amazing job closing income inequality and then this little pandemic thing hit, um, and it's outside, when it was first scored, might be 1.7 trillion, then add some interest on it, but it turns out it had dramatic impact on growing tax receipts. Okay. But in 20 months, our brothers and sisters on the left basically laid in 4.8 trillion. So like two and a half times more than the tax reform. Are they willing to be intellectually honest? and say, okay, maybe we're a little duplicitous in their language. And look, these, are get, these start getting into geeky. And one of the problems is when you start dealing in very large numbers on U.S. budget issues, and then in a time of inflation, the most rational way to do it is you do it by percentages of GDP. Except no one knows what that means but it's actually the proper way to do your comparisons because it basically normalizes what would be your inflationary growth. And this is just important to understand where the tax receipts coming, come from. The top 20% have an effective tax rate of about 15% of their income. The second quartile, so then the top, the next 20% down, functionally have 5.7% 5 5 of their income. But you get to the bottom 40%, the bottom 40% of income earners in America actually get money from the government. 
They don't pay taxes. They get money on income taxes. And the working middle class, if you're on that third quartile of 20%, so you're in that you know, 40 to 60%, you're paying 2.2% of your income. I don't think most of our friends around here, do you understand after the December 2017 tax reform, the United States actually, our income tax actually got more progressive. More progressive. Not less progressive. The working poor and the working middle class before tax reform actually paid a higher percentage of their income to income taxes than they do today. How many times have you ever heard that? Because we have a real trouble telling the truth about math around here because when it doesn't actually fit one person's campaign ad. But the facts are the fact. And this next one, this is a new chart for us. We're trying to figure out how you think about where the tax receipts come from. So let's have a little fun. If you're part of that tw top 20%, and understand the top 20%, Turns out it's a lot lower than 400,000, um, depending on parts of the country. Um, I think the top $400,000 and up is maybe you're in the top 5% of income earners. Okay, so, so, so understand what we're grabbing here. But they actually would pay about 209 days of the federal budget. Then the next group pays 44 days, next group 19 days, the bottom 40%, pays five days. So, the, so if you go from people of very, very poor up to the 40% of the population, they pay for five days of the federal budget. And then 88 days is borrowed. So you basically see 25, 30% of what we spend is borrowed. This is the math. Our brothers and sisters on the left believe we're going to finance the rest of the government from this population up here. I'm going to show you the slides saying, okay, maximize their tax rates. Maximize them up and down, everything. And then normalize it for the economic effects. You get about a point and a half, point, point six, one point six. It just doesn't get you there. Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, may I ask my time? The gentleman has approximately 28 minutes remaining. All right. I'll try to speak faster. <laughs> All right. So now some of this, the reason, and I'm doing this again, is I'm, I've just grown just exhausted trying to work with some of my brothers and sisters on the de Democrat side who I'll walk through the math and say, here's some ideas, here's some things we could do, and then, no, my people just want us to tax rich people more. Okay. Fine, maybe, maybe we should, okay, why do it. Um, okay, and then the next day, can we ne go back to talk about the problem? Because you didn't fix anything. Taxing the rich could raise at most 1% to 2% of GDP by maxing out all the different tax rates and then adjusting for the economic losses. Okay, so let's say you get the full 2%. We borrowed 8.4% of GDP last year. I know I've come back and done this again, but is anyone paying attention? So let's walk through this just a little bit more detail. I'll do this quickly. Maximizing sustainable revenues from taxing the rich. Okay, let's actually maximize income taxes. Um, raise the top two income tax brackets by another 10%. And there's actually a whole model out there where you, that, okay, and I need to probably explain this for someone that doesn't live in this economic world. There's this concept of I can, you can raise taxes to a point where you maximize receipts. Technically, government doesn't have revenues, we get receipts. Receipts but the next incremental tax hike rolls over and you start to get fewer receipts. We see this, capital gains is actually in many ways the most sensitive to this. 
where there's sort of this maximizing rate, and we actually have very, very good models on this now. So if you took every single tax and did the maximizing of the rates, and that's what we've actually seen here from removing itemized deductions to paring back um, retirement income, you know, abuses and all the other things, everything, everything you can do, and go up and down the list, and you start to see the calculations. And actually, if anyone wants to see um, Manhattan Institute, um, I think it's Brian Riedel, um, about two months ago, actually has a fairly detailed paper. And it's all referenced. And it's not only just referenced from Tax Foundation, um, Joint Tax, CBO, but even some progressive groups are in the footnotes on how this math works. So this is if you maximized every single tax. And why this gets important is I'm why don't I just skip to the punchline? It looks like when you do the economic adjustment, you get 1.1 to 2% of GDP by taxing the rich. OK, maybe we should do that. Maybe it'll make us feel better. Because God knows we now make our public policy here by our feelings. But. The point I keep coming back to is we borrowed 8.4% of GDP last year. And if you actually do the blend, you get about a point and a half. And that's how childish the discussion is here. You ask for real math, real policy decisions. So we on the right, we're going to battle each other and try to cut parts of discretionary, non-defense discretionary. OK, there's a bunch of that I'd love to get rid of. It's a really interesting ethical question. Is it ethical for us to borrow money and give it to entities around the country that have their own taxing authority? Now, that's going to be politically really unpopular. But it is sort of absurd we do that. And that's actually about 40% of non-defense discretionary is actually transfers to entities that have their own taxing authority. But if you're functionally borrowing $80, $90 billion a month, you just covered you know, three, three and a quarter months worth of borrowing by wiping out most of the discretionary budget. And then the next year gets worse, the next year gets worse, the next year gets worse. Because remember, 100% of the future borrowing is driven by Medicare. And then in nine years when the Social Security Trust Fund is gone, and I showed you the scale of that. Mr. Speaker, I've come behind, the, behind this microphone for years now and walked actually through some really interesting things we can do. We saw during the one minute some of our brothers and sisters here came up and talked about this being diabetes awareness. Diabetes is the single biggest cost of healthcare, it's actually the single biggest cost to this government. 33% um, of healthcare, 31% of Medicare. I've come up here repeatedly and talked about what we could do in the farm bill, the um, new blood glucose monitors, um, the discussion of some of the GLP-1s and the effect they're having on obesity and um, diabetes. There is a path, and it turns out the Joint Economic Committee about four months ago, the Republican side, chapter three, we actually did we went where we're not supposed to go, but it was real math. We talked about our brothers and sisters' longevity, the fact that the last four years, life expectancy in the United States has fallen. And if you actually look at the math, what's the number one reason? It wasn't drugs. Drugs was what there? It was obesity. Let's actually have an honest conversation, because it also turns out it's not only a moral battle to save our brothers and sisters from dying young, it also is the most powerful thing you can do to starting to stabilize US debt, is helping Americans be healthier. Isn't that something neat? Is that Republican or Democrat? It's neither. It's just the right thing to do. And we were coming up with a few trillion dollars over 10 years by taking on obesity because of diabetes, heart disease, kidney failures, all these other things. Um, 
I'm just trying to do two things here. Have an understanding how brutally ugly the actual debt and deficit math is and that the solutions being provided to it are just fantasy land, ridiculous, childish, asinine. And then the second thing I'm trying to do when I come behind this mic, there are things we can do to have a revolution and stabilize this debt, and none of them are going to be easy. But in the complexity is the morality. We could make people, we could work with people to be healthier. We could bring technology to make lives easier, to provide more access, particularly to healthcare, and you would disrupt the cost. The hardest part for us as electeds, you're going to have to deal with those armies of lobbyists marching up and down your hallways, and look them in the eye and say, in many ways, the morality, the cure, is in the disruption of doing the right and moral thing. I just don't know if this body has the intellectual prowess to actually deal with it. And with that, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back.